Uh, so I'm going to take a, a small detour and talk a little bit about a, a group of individuals who you would expect to have much lower prevalence of cardiovascular disease, and certainly they do. Although the, uh, the sting in the tail, if you like, of exercise and, and those who engage in high volumes of exercise is this story about athletes who develop atrial fibrillation. So we do know, though, that atrial fibrillation, like other forms of cardiovascular disease, is positively influenced by being physically active. On the left-hand side is some data from the Cardiovascular Health Study in the US, which shows that with increasing levels of, of walking habits, uh, combining both distance and intensity, we see the risk of atrial fibrillation decline by about 30 to 40 percent. Uh, and on, the, on, uh, on your right-hand side, you'll also see some data that shows that if we objectively quantify how fit somebody is, then uh, a higher level of fitness is associated with a much lower incidence of atrial fibrillation in individuals that are otherwise free of any other cardiovascular disease. And likewise, what we see is that atrial fibrillation, once you take out the, the relatively strong effects, obviously, of age and the presence of structural heart disease, we see that a large burden of the atrial fibrillation that we would see is due to modifiable uh, risk factors such as hypertension, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea and diabetes, all of things which would also be positively influenced by being physically active. However, there is a, a growing burden of da data that's appeared over the last two decades that shows that athletes or people who've previously been engaged in high volumes of exercise training have an excess of atrial fibrillation above what we would expect. So these are individuals that are otherwise in good health. We know that their mortality is lower, their cardiovascular disease burden is otherwise lower, but they do develop atrial fibrillation. One of the challenges, however, though, is we could put any number on the risk associated with this. So there, as you see on the, le on the figure on the uh, screen here, these are all the studies that have been performed up until the point at which we reviewed these. And there is, there are studies that show that the risk is about 10 to 15 fold, which I think is highly exaggerated. But then there is also some bigger studies, some prospective cohort studies that show that the risk of atrial fibrillation is probably only 30 to 40 percent higher than that of people who don't engage in so much exercise. In contrary to what's uh, uh, commonly perceived, is this isn't an elite athlete issue. This is something that we see in a lot of people who engage in volumes of exercise. Uh, upwards of 10 to 15 hours per week, but are not at the elite level. And a majority of these studies are in individuals who are slightly older. These are tending not to be young elite endurance athletes. This tends to be those who are in the uh, age groups above 40 years of age. It's a large male dominance, and there is a substantial variation in how AF is adjudicated, ranging from self-report to uh, medical record diagnoses up to regular ECGs. So that probably all of those factors are explaining why we see such variation in the risk estimates associated with exercise. Perhaps the most convincing data comes from a Scandinavian trial that followed participants of a long distance cross country ski race over 50 kilometers, uh, 50,000 individuals, and they compared uh, individuals based on the number of participations in the race as a surrogate of their training history. And what we would see then is that those who had participated in more than five races over their uh, lifetime had uh, around a 30% increase in the risk of atrial fibrillation compared to those who participated only once. So the control group here are people who've done a cross-country ski race of 50 kilometers, certainly not somebody we'd say is sedentary, uh, but nonetheless, it's probably quite convincing based on the fact that it's prospective. There is uh, this uh, blinded adjudication of AF events, uh, and it's a large population. So then we move to thinking about what the mechanisms might be in this group. Why would people who are otherwise healthy have a lower burden of cardiovascular disease develop atrial fibrillation? And so some of the factors that we are at least confident may be involved, include the substantial atrial dilatation we would see in endurance athletes, in somebody who is a, an endurance athlete who may be capable of achieving cardiac outputs in excess of 30 liters per minute. We see this volume load, which leads to uh, dilation of the atria. We see that this leads also to pulmonary vein stretch, which might increase the prevalence of uh, pulmonary vein triggers uh, manifesting as atrial ectopic beats. As I'll show you, there is uh, certainly some preclinical evidence for a role 
of cardiac inflammation, potentially leading to fibrosis, and we've also got some great uh, preclinical work there. And we also know that athletes, one of the hallmarks of being an athlete, and, or the cardiac changes associated with exercise is this uh, bradycardia, potentially due at least in part due to a high vagal tone, uh, which we know alters the refractoriness in the atria, predisposing to atrial fibrillation, although protective of other arrhythmias uh, below, the, um, uh, below the atria. So let's think about what happens to the, to the left and the right atrium during exercise. So there is some data here on the left-hand side which shows that as the cardiac output goes up, uh, we see that the atrial pressure uh, starts to increase and we see substantial increases in the atrial pressure around about 30 litres per minute, the kind of level that somebody who is particularly well trained in endurance sports might be able to achieve. Uh, and we also know that AF inducibility, when you acutely stretch the atria, in this case on the right hand side with saline loading and you increase the atrial pressure, that there are some electrophysiological changes which increase the inducibility of atrial fibrillation. Now that is an acute setting, but theoretically if we pr consistently stretch the atria with regular exercise, perhaps 10 to 15 hours per week or more, then this might manifest as some electrophysiological changes which uh, lead to the initiation of AF. The atrial remodeling that we see in athletes is, is relatively profound. So we've published some data here on the left hand side which shows that the, the uh, dilation of the atria is proportionate to the degree of lifetime training hours. This is an endurance uh, sports participants ranging from recreational athletes up to former Tour de France participants. And in those who've engaged in more than 6,000 lifetime hours, we see that there is a, a, a larger atria and the prevalence or the presence at least of moderate to severe atrial dilation is much higher. And this has been shown also from some colleagues of ours in Dallas who in this study actually initiate, in, it's a randomised controlled trial of exercise training uh, in excess of around six hours per week. They see that over 12 months in the group here in the middle, there is some uh, very uh, early changes in the left atrial size. And you can see that when they compared those to masters athletes who've been doing this over a lifetime, uh, that there is a significant increase in atrial size in excess of 40 milliliters per meter squared on the index volume. And it's probably not just this. We know that atrial size is a risk factor for atrial fibrillation, but there is probably more to the story in terms of atrial remodeling. Uh, and certainly we have very nice preclinical data from several groups uh, overseas showing that there is a presence of atrial fibrosis in animals who are subjected to endurance exercise. In this case, this is mice who are swim exercise. And we can see that when you look at the uh, left atrial, at least from the appendage, there is an increase in fibrosis, but we don't see those changes in the left ventricle. Likewise, from Stan Nattel's group uh, in Canada, in, in collaboration with the group in Barcelona of Louis Mont, showed very nicely that when you subjected rats to 16 weeks of exercise or endurance exercise every day, which is equivalent approximately to 10 human years of training, there is the development of a fibrosis in both the right and the left atria, uh, and that this is not completely reversed when those rats are able to uh, detrain. So we know that this fibrosis is probably important. We know from some clinical models now that fibrosis may be very useful in, in predicting outcomes from pulmonary vein isolation and other ablation techniques. Uh, in athletes, we only really have the preclinical uh, data to support that. But we also know that exercise is associated with some pretty profound inflammation, certainly in the post-exercise period. So in these animal models of exercise-induced AF, uh, compared to a sedentary group, we see that swim-exercised animals and treadmill-exercised animals uh, um, have a much higher prevalence of sustained AF. But when we are able to prevent the cardiac-based inflammation using uh, either available drugs now, a tanercept in this case, or using genetic knockout of TNF-alpha, that the fibrosis that you see with uh, exercise in these animals, the scarring of the atria is prevented, and that also contributes at least to the prevention of the development of atrial fibrillation in those animals. So in those groups treated with the tanercept or genetic knockout of TNF-alpha, 
so knocking out the inflammatory process within the heart, these animals don't develop atrial fibrillation. So it confirms, at least in a preclinical setting, that there's a role for inflammation in the heart. So we also, in that earlier slide, suggested that these pulmonary vein triggers, these ectopic beats arising uh, or from the pulmonary veins, potentially leading to the initiation of atrial fibrillation, as both David and um, Stuart have shown uh, in their early slides, this may be more, it's been proposed at least, that this may be more prevalent in athletes, although we haven't been able to show that. So amongst our groups of people with varying training histories, we don't see this training dependent dose effect on the prevalence of atrial ectopic beats. And this was also confirmed in the Dallas study uh, more recently as well when they looked at former athletes. You do see athletes with a, a fairly heavy dominance of atrial ectopic beats, but it's not more common than what we would see in in uh, less experienced athletes or non-athletes. Um, so we can probably, at least in, some, in many of these cases, rule out the role for the pulmonary vein triggers that might be occurring. But if we look at vagal tone, which is heavily uh, suggested to be involved in the development of arrhythmias, it's quite clear that if you use widely available techniques to measure vagal tone, so the most common being heart rate variability, the variability we see in the R to R intervals, you can see that this measure of vagal tone is elevated in athletes. Uh, some unpublished data from our group is shown there. And we know that there's a partial contribution, at least, to the development of AF in those preclinical models of athletes where you see atrial fibrillation develop. But in similarly, when you look at that preclinical data, that if you block some of that vagal activity using atropine, then it doesn't completely abolish the presence of atrial fibrillation. So although there seems to be some individuals, some athletes, who develop predominantly vagal AF, they either get it after a meal, or certainly in the recovery period from high-intensity exercise, or overnight, which is suggesting of a vagal dominance there, uh, it doesn't seem to be the only factor. Many people, almost all athletes you would see, would have a high vagal activity, but they don't all develop atrial fibrillation. So there are probably several parts to the recipe that are needed to develop AF. So we have proposed then that there is this progressive remodeling of the atria that might lead to atrial, uh, to atrial fibrillation amongst all individuals, not just athletes, but certainly with the development of other risk factors, uh, manifesting as early subclinical episodes of AF that may be undetected by the individual. Maybe an athlete just notices them due to heart rate monitoring during exercise. They're not necessarily feeling a great deal different. Uh, but this can progressively uh, remodel the atria and then lead to the persistence of atrial fibrillation over time if not dealt with at some stage. And there's a lot of information about how we might be able to deal with that, whether it's going for early pulmonary vein isolation or considering some sort of detraining options depending on the athlete's status. So there are a number of issues we still have to address in this. We need to do a better job of translating some of those preclinical rodent models into human athletes. Do human athletes develop atrial fibrosis, very difficult to assess directly. We're trying some with uh, a number of MRI techniques. We need to get a better handling of what the actual prevalence is amongst human athletes. Uh, so there are lots of case control studies or retrospective cohort studies that suggest it may be between 2 and 10 percent of endurance athletes who develop atrial fibrillation. And then we need to start thinking about whether we can identify at-risk athletes. One of the largely unconsidered uh, drivers of AF is the fact that we're now seeing that people with high lean body mass have a much higher risk of atrial fibrillation, consistent with previous observations that taller individuals are most likely to develop atrial fibrillation as well. Maybe this is partly in, in amongst the story. And then we need to think about managing AF. So whether rhythm control using catheter ablation or antiarrhythmic medications might be optional. Uh, we've got uh, several small single centre studies that suggest that athletes seem to do equivalently well to non-athletes in terms of outcomes from pulmonary vein isolation or ablation techniques. Whether they can tolerate rate control, uh, beta blockers in athletes are generally not well tolerated, or that's not always the case. Considering anticoagulation, although many athletes have very low prevalence of other risk factors that might push their chads vas score up to a level requiring anticoagulation. And then addressing the story of, of detraining. Uh, very, very few of the athletes we see are willing to consider detraining, particularly if they're professional or competitive athletes. Uh, 
Um, so although it's widely suggested, we need to try and, try and avoid that where possible unless it's absolutely necessary. And so just to finally mention that, that we're, uh, amongst Australia, we're leading a large multi-centre trial, which is a longitudinal study of all elite endurance athletes now entering the elite programs and certainly those retiring or who have previously been in elite sports programs across Australia and Europe. Uh, this is a collaboration between our centre and the Baker Institute of Melbourne and colleagues from Belgium. But we are looking for young athletes, endurance athletes, entering in an elite program compared to non-athletes that are age matched, comparing them with retiring and former masters athletes. But also we're interested in hearing from individuals with uh, a, a history of endurance training who have developed arrhythmias because we're now starting to use some of the mapping techniques that Stuart alluded to earlier to try and get some understanding of what's happening at the electroanatomical model within the atria of these individuals. Uh, so if anybody is interested or knows of, uh, of any athletes who might be uh, interested in participating in that study, then they'd be free to contact us. Uh, so in summary then, endurance exercise training is associated with what we estimate to probably be closer to around a two-fold risk increase in AF risk. Once you adjust for all the other uh, issues that might arise, the differences in age and, and risk factors. But we don't really know the true prevalence. We need to do better to get a handling of that, and hopefully the product heart study will allow us to do that. It is likely driven predominantly by an arrhythmogenic substrate, that is the fibrosis that develops, coupled with the increase of nature or size. Coupling those with the autonomic changes that require, uh, come about as a result of frequent high volume exercise, trying to address atrial fibrosis, whether it's through existing imaging techniques or more novel imaging techniques, uh, is going to be critical in understanding what the mechanisms that promote AF in athletes are. And we really need those longitudinal studies. Almost everything we know about the athlete's heart comes from cross-sectional comparisons of athletes versus non-athletes. Very rarely have athletes been studied, studied through their whole careers to look at what happens and, and when all of these cardiac changes start to occur. Thank you very much.